Hello and welcome to our first ever live streamed Stuart Saturday show. I'm your hostess, Andrea Zuvich, the 17th century lady, and I'm a historian of the 17th century, specializing in the late Stuart period. So that's 1660 to 1714, really. Um, I've published three nonfiction history books and three fiction works about the period including The Stuarts in 100 Facts, A Year in the Life of Stuart Britain, Sex and Sexuality in Stuart Britain, and my first ever biography called, uh, titled Ravenous is uh, about Charles II's most infamous mistress, Barbara Villas, and that will hopefully be published in 2024. Now, we are live streaming on YouTube X and Patreon. We were planning to go live on Facebook Live, but we were thwarted. But uh, you should be able to see it on these other platforms. So um, I apologize for that, but thank you for staying with us. My husband, Gavin, is the director of this show and he's monitoring the live chat. Now, I uh, apologize as well in advance if our puppy Bertrand starts barking at any time. Um, and indeed, please excuse any further technical hitches, as of course, this is the first episode and we're feeling our way. Things should become smoother as we go along. So thank you. Um, if, if you don't know who I am, uh, I'm originally from the United States. My parents are from Chile in the um, in, in South America. Um, but I've lived in the United Kingdom and England for about 15 years now. And um, so uh, I have what is, uh, what I'm often told is a funny accent. So <laughs> um, due to the nature of my husband's work, I've uh, lived and traveled all over the UK and I've had a, a very wide array of experiences living in places like London, Lancashire, Windsor, uh, yeah, and that's me outside Windsor Castle. <laughs> um, and also Shropshire. And I now reside in the beautiful county of Derbyshire, England, near breathtaking historical sites such as Haddon Hall, Chatsworth, Bolsover Castle, and Hardwick Hall. And that's uh, me outside Hardwick Hall after a very rainy walk. And that's my dog, Bertrand. Uh, and uh, it's it's a delightful place to live. Um, I'm very grateful to have had the opportunity to have some wonderful adventures, visiting history-rich places in my time throughout the United Kingdom. And here I was um, some years ago outside Blenheim Palace, which is a, a very special place to me uh, personally. Um, some of you may know me as the hostess of Stuart Saturday uh, on Twitter and also the uh, 17th Century Lady blog and might have followed or participated in the Stuart Saturday or Stuart's Saturday hashtag on Twitter, which I've been doing for about a decade now. Every Saturday I've picked a theme and people contribute posts about it. Uh, over the years, it's turned into a, a warm and lively community of history lovers, passionate about the historical figures, events, music, art, and more about the Stuart period. Today, of course, will be different, and I'll be answering some of the questions you've kindly sent in, and which have been selected by Gavin. We are aiming to produce this kind of online show once a month, for approximately one hour, we'll see. Things might change. Um, but for now, the show will be split into two different parts. The first will be a Q&A, a question and answer session, and that will be followed by a guest who will talk with me about the Stuart period. And I'm hoping to have a different guest for each show. In future, we may just simply focus on chatting with our, our guest, but at this point, nothing is carved into stone. Today's guest will be my friend and fellow historian, Liam Maloney, who will be talking to us live from Dublin, Ireland. Finally, if you would like to support my show, 
you can do so via Patreon, directly via PayPal, or you can buy me a coffee. I like lattes. <laughs> there are special benefits for patrons. Please do have a look. Well, Gad, it's time for a Q&A. Gavin Darlin, what's our first question, please? All right, here we go. Robert asked, what were some of the most important discoveries of the 17th century? Oh, well, that's quite something. There's, there's a lot to say. Um, well, first of all, hi, Robert. Thank you for your question. Um, where to begin? Well, the 17th century had so many hugely important discoveries. It would take hours to properly answer you. So I think I'm going to try to narrow it down for the sake of time. One of the biggest ones was uh, the concept of blood circulation. And now this is sometimes a bit controversial because there are some other um, uh, people who say that it might have been someone else in a different time. But um, English physician William Harvey is credited with discovering that blood circulates or moves freely throughout the body via the veins. Oh, and here's an image of William Harvey. In the late Stuart period, uh, Isaac Newton invented a reflecting telescope, which is also known as the Newtonian telescope. Uh, the 17th century saw a meteoric rise in what we now call science. It was the century of greats such as Galileo Galilei, Johannes Kepler, Tycho Brahe, among others. Inventions such as water pumps, telescopes, barometers, compound microscopes. Oh, the, the list goes on and on. Actually, I think this deserves a whole podcast, Robert. So uh, yes, I think we might be doing that. <laughs> Maybe next week, we'll see. All right, uh, may we please have the second question? Uh, and this comes from Jackie. Jackie asked, why did you choose to study the 17th century? Hmm. Well, that's a that's a pers that's quite a personal question. Let's see. Um, I think when I was a girl, I remember either was gifted a book or I got it from the library at school, and it was about Henry VIII and his wives. And so, like many people, I got into history via the tutors. Um, and I thought the whole concept of, of writing about another time and of people from another time was amazing. And I thought it was just an incredible thing. And I said to myself, I, I want to be a historian. I, I, I want to do that. And during high school, I gravitated towards history and the drama department. And um, I was very fortunate in that I had a superb drama teacher. And she loved and appreciated fine literature and the works of William Shakespeare, whose works I had been enjoying for a number of years by that point. Um, and I was quite, okay, here he is, Shakespeare. <laughs> um, I, was, I was quite shy at that time and, and uh, she saw something in me that perhaps my peers didn't really. Um, they uh, they were all being cool, going to the beach and partying and going to football games, and I wasn't into any of that. Uh, <laughs> and and this, that just didn't interest me. But uh, my drama teacher, she encouraged me to follow my the things that I really loved and, and had a great interest in. And uh, so I auditioned for and got lead roles in several of her Shakespearean productions. And it was wonderful for me as a teenager. And uh, later on at college, I was into Jacobean theater. I was doing Thomas Kidd's The Spanish, uh, the Spanish Tragedy, um, uh, Ben Jonson's works, Christopher Marlowe, all, all these other people from that time. And a lot of people don't realize that Shakespeare wasn't just a, an Elizabethan or a playwright. He was a, he lived for 16 years of the 17th century. And um, I, I, so I was interested in this, uh, the peripheral history 
of when he lived. And that sort of snowballed into getting to know the music of the time period, the literature, the art, and oh my goodness, I love the art. The art is just superb from the 17th century. And uh, so I think, uh, and the music, Vivaldi, Handel, Bach, from, they were people born in the 1670s, 1680s, and all of that was just so beautiful to me, and it still is. So that's a long-winded explanation, but that's why I decided to study university at, to study history at university, because of love, mainly Shakespeare, Shakespeare's fault. <laughs> okay, can I have uh, question number three, please? Right, Nick. Nick asks, what was a popular fruit or vegetable that the stewards used, but we don't? Okay, well, I had a good think about this, and the stewards ate many of the same fruits and vegetables that we eat today. However, um, one fruit that came to mind was the medlar. Now, some people certainly know what this is, uh, but in my experience, most people don't have a clue what this is. And that's fine because most people don't grow these anymore. Um, and now I, I've never seen one stocked in the supermarkets or specialist green gross or anything. And oh yes, this is uh, an image from our tree. And uh, medlar fruit grows on trees. And this is the around five-year-old medlar tree that we planted in our backyard about three years ago. And this is how the fruits form on the tree. And this is how they looked in June this year. So unlike other fruits, the medlar requires a different approach. Nicholas Culpepper, who was a herbalist and author from the 17th century, wrote of medlars in his book, The English Physician, that the tree growth near the bigness of the quince tree, spreading branches reasonable large with longer and narrower leaves than either the apple or quince. The fruit is very harsh before it is mellowed. So the next image we have shows my medlar fruit as they began to blet or rot. And this is when we can start to eat them. Um, as we learned from Culpepper, because uh, it goes from hard and unpleasant uh, to soft and juicy and sweet. I personally like to wait until at least one frost has been on uh, on them and come, and, and then I can harvest them all and we can make medley. As for what it tastes like, I would say something between quince and honey. Some people might disagree with that, but that's how I think it, it it's most like. And my seven-year-old really likes it. Uh, yeah, well, thank you for those questions. That's the end of our Q&A. Uh, do send in your questions for next month. Right, and next up we have our interview. It's time for the second part of today's show. And my friend and fellow historian, Liam Maloney, you may know him as the creator of the Keep It Stewart hashtag under his handle, Cheap Sellotape. Now, Liam attended University College Dublin and completed the single subject History BA and the Early, his, early Modern History BA, MA. His work centered on the tumultuous mid 17th century in Ireland and the Restoration period. He has been part of research projects concerning Dublin, its schools and markets. On the other hand, exploration of the polar regions with a particular focus on Sir Ernest Shackleton, has been a large research theme over the last decade. He lives in North County, Dublin, where he is joining us live. Hi, Liam. Welcome to Stuart Salad Saturday. Thank you for joining us. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we, we've known each other for a number of years, and I think it was due to Stuart Saturday on Twitter, was it not? Yes, that was certainly it. Yeah. Uh, is, is the volume okay for, for audio? Is that okay? Yes, yeah, we're, you're coming in nice and clear. Yeah, <laughs> great. Uh, so, yeah, definitely was true at Saturday. It's just the excuse to go and look for pretty pictures online and, and share yeah, them. That was exactly it. it. 
<laughs> I, I did a little bit of scrolling earlier on through our extensive uh, Twitter messages, and I, I found a, your first message of, hey, you, you're okay. It was about September 2018, and I'm surprised it was only five years ago. <laughs> oh, it seemed a lot longer than that. Okay. Doesn't it? Well, I'm surprised. And then I, I found some emails as well later on that year of me sending you things like Richard Head's The Mist Displayed, that saucy uh, novel. Oh, with very helpful. And of course, Liam was very helpful for <laughs> that. Yes. <laughs> yes, my book, Sex and Sexuality in Stuart Britain. He's amazingly, uh, he, he's, he's one of the best historians I'm, I'm lucky enough to know. So, yeah, do check out his Twitter if you're not already doing so. Um, you've tutored and uh, taught history at University College Dublin and had the enviable position as a guest lecturer on cruise ships, lucky thing, um, to Antarctica. Not many people can say that, can they? Um, you mm -hmm. uh, delight the Stuart Saturday <laughs> history community on X. Um, but before you did MA with, uh, you did your MA with UCD, that's correct, right? Um, yes. And uh, could you please tell us about the subject of your research, if you don't mind? Yeah, uh, I named uh, appropriately a long title to the MA thesis called The Best Interest His Majesty Has in This Kingdom, the Earl of Orrery, and the Defense of the Protestant Interest in the Restoration Settlements of Ireland, 1660 to 65. So there's a lovely oh, there image is. of the a lovely image of the man himself. Wow. Um, I I tried to do several things in that work, uh, and I'll try to outline a few of them here. So firstly, I tried to look at how he managed his own legacy and how he framed his own career. His role in the restoration of 1660 uh, and the shape of the state, that being the Kingdom of Ireland but also the reintroduction and the shape of the state church and how that developed separate to that of England. He portrayed himself as a spokesman, a leader, if you will, of the new English interest of Ireland. And he portrayed them as the most loyal demograph of Ireland and the rightful governors, shall we say, and portraying himself as the leader and spokesman of that, whether that is truthful or spin is debatable. Uh, as part of that, I looked also at a, a kind of a pamphlet battle he had with Franciscan Peter Walsh in the mid 1660s, which uh, he countered Walsh's attempt to create a formula, an oath, an oath of such that Irish Catholics could take to maintain their secular loyalty to King while also maintaining their um, spiritual relationship and allegiance to the pontiff in Rome. Uh, that was taken on as quite a political battle uh, and used by people to conquer and uh, divide and conquer in a way. As well as that, you know, obviously the main part for, for Arri probably was his own framing and management of the act of settlement and then later the act of explanation of the Irish land settlement and his management of and through that uh, of the Irish House of Commons and Lords in Dublin. I see. Now, for, for those of us who don't know what uh, that land settlement was about, can you briefly explain what that is about, please? So to those uh, viewers who, who, not, who aren't really sure what, that, what that's about. Briefly, probably not. <laughs> I'll probably give it not, but... The, a, a wonderful phrase that, that Coleman Denny he used in, as his title of his Restoration Ireland book is always settling, never settled. Um, and one can argue that it took until the turn of the 18th century for this to be totally fixed to someone's benefit. I suppose the idea of land ownership is what political power and status is based upon across this period, across all of Europe. Land compass occurred uh, extensively, particularly relevant for us here in uh, after the Cromwellian conquest in the 1650s. Uh, mm. In particular, the percentage of land held by Irish Catholics uh, decreased extensively because of mm. their perceived uh, threat to the state, 
the kingdom because mostly from the outbreak of the 1641 rebellion and on. When the restoration of the monarchy occurred, that process had to be reevaluated. Uh, those who were loyal to the king across the 40s and 50s had to be recompensated. Those who re remained loyal had to be re um, stored for their lands. So that required an utterly fresh way of looking at the, con uh, the conquest, the confiscation, and distribution of land ownership. I see. Wow. Well, that kind of works. Thoroughly <laughs> complex. <laughs> Thank you. That's a, it's a thoroughly complex situation. Um, mm. um, thanks for that. Um, what was it about Ori? Excuse me if I'm not pronouncing that correctly, but uh, that urged you to do such in depth research. Um, in your Maynooth University talk, The Earl of Orrery and the Defense of the Protestant Interest in the Settlement of Ireland, you said, Orrery is seen to thrive at reconciling conflicting parties or maintaining deep hostilities. For those who don't know much about him, were there aspects to his personality that you admired or loathed or anything in between? <laughs> it's a range. Uh... I think that's appropriately contradictory, that kind of thing I said. He loves bringing people together, but also making sure they don't get co too close together. Uh, I suppose initially he appeared in my undergraduate research, and I was interested by the political survivalism of people like Ari. Um, so over a period of, of regime change and devastating warfare, that a character could continue to be at the helm of something, whether that's fictional or not. So it's that kind of idea that somebody can continue to be a part of a political nation and be at the forefront of the state administration. That's the kind of thing that brought him to my attention first at the undergraduate level. Uh, right. As well as that, I suppose just tracing his restoration career was interesting as well, because 1660, he's, he's Lord's Justice, in Dublin, he's one of three. But then his career becomes more periphery, peripheral. Ormond, the Duke of Ormond, arrived as Lord Lieutenant, uh, taking over central government. Ari is still a privy councillor, but is relegated to some degree to his provincial uh, Lord Presidency of Munster, a, a Tudor uh, office, um, mm. uh, which, which gave him judicial and military obligations and the status. But of course, those offices were then suppressed later on, so he becomes even less significant. So tracing this idea of his peripheral career and that trajectory, I thought that was quite interesting as well. Hmm, I see. Something, I suppose, we'll, we'll come back to this kind of writing style, but his effusive letter writing, and it's probably more accurate to call it sycophantic letter writing style. He's just constantly writing to Ormond saying, God, you're brilliant, and can you give me all the stuff? Foreman's response it's, is usually, here we go again. <laughs> but it's funny, though, in the Stuart period, um, there is a lot of this effusive, um, sentimental sort of style of writing in, in, in letters. And um, he might be uh, more sycophantic than some, but there is that overwhelming sense of... of uh, effusiveness, I suppose. Yeah. yeah, so he's definitely representative in that, but I think in particular, mm. he's an example of that kind of, here we go again, <laughs> yes. will he just, please just get to the point. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> well, um, let's see, that that reminds me of something. He, um, he lived and had to be part of several major events, wasn't he? Um, uh, I don't know if many people know how badly Ireland was affected by the tumultuous 1640s. Uh, I mean, many do know how awful the situation was in Ireland under Oliver Cromwell. And they might know about the Ulster uprising of 1641. But uh, the period of the English or British civil wars impacted people greatly in Ireland. Do you have any thoughts about that? 
Yes, now without being too controversial and mentioning that name who shan't be named in this particular part of the world. Um, Sorry. <laughs> that's, that's all right. Um, um, I suppose the, the, way, the way that I like to think about it is, uh, it's a very, as, as you said earlier on, it's a very complex period. And yes. something along the lines of breaking it into its sections kind of helps. So uh, in, in something that Jane Allmeyer wrote a number of years ago, uh, she broke it into three kind of sections. So there's from the so 1641 to 43, from 43 to 47, and 47 to 53. That first period is uh, from the outbreak of that 1641 rebellion in October, um, beginning in Ulster, as you said, but then, of course, taking in most of the island. The beginning then and going to about 43, where there's a cessation of arms. Um, mostly between, uh, shall we say, an attempt at home government, the, the Catholic Confederacy, um, mm. and it does exactly what it says in the tin. Uh, so from there <clears throat> to 47, with ongoing conflict across the entire island, there are peace negotiations between the Catholic Confederacy and mostly the royalist forces led by the then Earl and then Marcus of Ormond, James Butler. Most of these fail. Uh, there's lots of conniving going on and uh, all of that kind of politics. However, there is a cessation in 47, the first Ormond peace. Uh, the attempt to bring Ireland under some kind of royalist control so that it can be of assistance to the, shall we say, um, decreasing fortunes of the royalist forces in England in particular. Mm. That brings you up to that 47, that second kind of phase. The third then, 47, 53, really is the increasing successes of the forces of the English Parliament in Ireland against both the Catholic Confederacy forces and that of the Royalists under Ormond. Including in that also is then, of course, the, uh, the, new, the arrival of a new model army under mm -hmm. Cromwell in 49 after the execution of the king. And then, of course, the successful uh, progression of the Cromwellian conquest. So that, that kind of tripartite section kind of, it's, it's a nice way I like to try to think of it, that it, it, it is in sections and it, despite the fact that it can seem like an utter complex mess, uh, you can see that it is full of those long-standing rivalries and the relatively new conflicts that are heightened by Charles's policies of Ireland. Mm -hmm. Well, it is a very complex time, and I remember when I first started uh, to do my university work uh, about the Stuart period, I was actually quite daunted by the uh, prospect of learning about all of the Irish history and the um, even even the, the British civil wars were I, it just it, it was a bit frightening because it's so complex. Um, mm. But uh, I ended up doing some undergraduate work on on the Ulster uprising of 1641 so I you can conquer it and you can do it you can wrap your head around it all that it is it is a very complex situation um but thank you so much for that yeah, yeah. indeed um so uh I did read about how Ori wasn't personally involved in Charles I's trial and execution was he um, I, I think I remember he went to live in Somerset and he got into some trouble with uh, Cromwell um, for doing so. Um, do you know what Cromwell wanted from him? I suppose, for a start, I think the story is part of I mentioned earlier on the idea of, of Ari managing his legacy and how his career yes. was framed. I think mm. this is part of it. I see. So, yes. as the story goes, mm -hmm. After the execution of the king, uh, Ari or Baron Brogel, as he was at the time, uh, a previous uh, title, both of these places are in County Cork. So if you, if you mispronounce them, all you're doing is annoying people from Cork and me as a Dubliner, that's fine. So th the story goes that after the, the execution of the king, Brogel became disenfranchised with the whole enterprise and decided to go and find the king in exile on the continent. He came through England, through London, and was apprehended by Cromwell, as this story goes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He was apprehended, and his life and his fortunes were at the, uh, the great man's 
hand. He was then offered a commission as a general to fight the rebellious Irish back at home in Ireland. So at this stage, as the story goes, Brogel was honour bound to Cromwell and he put his inherent royalism act to one side and said, okay, I'll fight for Ireland. I'll fight for um, the position of the, the Protestant interest, essentially. Back he goes to Ireland uh, to fight the Irish. And again, suppressing his, his royalism until his honor bound allegiance to the person of Oliver Cromwell. And then of course, after the, the overthrow of the son, the next Lord uh, protector, so after all that goes out, his personal honour-bound obligations to the Cromwells are gone. So, so then he said, I could then, you know, his, his royalism could be put into practice again. So he fought for the restoration of the king. However, all of this is utter nonsense. <laughs> um, even up until the last minute uh, of December 59 into January 60, Brogel had no intention of fighting or allowing for the king's return. These Stuarts, they weren't of any interest to him. Ah. He kept his cards close to his chest up until the last minute again, until uh, the way that England was going was very obvious. So the, 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 I suppose with General Monk's um, mm. march south, and then the way that the restoration of the full parliament went. So then he declared openly for the king, obviously. <laughs> right, I see. Oh, fascinating. I'd like to learn more about this uh, this fellow. Um, and I'm sure others do as well. Um, now, Liam, there are, uh, there's so much we could talk about, but uh, are there areas of early modern Irish history that you wish you could have more research about? Do you, Is there something you'd like to see more about um, well, we all we all got exactly what we wanted over the last couple of weeks with Breed McGrath's new uh, volume on the workings of the Irish Parliament, uh, particularly from she goes from sixteen thirteen to forty eight, and it is a monster volume. It is a, a really a her lifetime's work thus far from gathering wow. uh, sources that's across amazing. across the continents, uh, and I think mm -hmm. that's that's going to be a really important book. Um, well, excellent. Yes, that, that's, I didn't. I didn't hear about this, so that, that's really good. Yes, Breed, Breed's a, an amazing scholar and a really kind uh, scholar too. She thanks me um, simply for just bringing a portrait to her attention. Uh, so that collective um, way that historians work is something she values. And if she if she thanks somebody like me, she you know she's. <laughs> uh, I, I think that really shows her. her uh, well, if, if she's uh, watching right now, congratulations. That sounds wonderful. Well done. <laughs> if I could just work, I was at the launch. It was great oh, to be there. Oh, excellent. That's wonderful. Um, great. Okay. Um, Liam, uh, could you tell people how they can follow you on social media? Or is there anything? Because um, you do your polar history, and he does some wonderful posts on polar history. Um, and, and he does write 17th century history on, on X. So uh, do follow him on both. But uh, what's your Facebook page called, please? Yes, the, uh, the Facebook is, is mostly, oh, well, is it's polar history, full stop. Uh, the, I accidentally got involved in all that about 10 years ago. Uh, it's very simply just called, uh, the page is called Shackleton's Endurance. Um, and the, the profile picture is a, is a sketch by a friend, uh, Sarah Barnard, of Shackleton himself. So uh, that's how you'd be able to find that. Yeah, that's great. It's a beautifully done portrait. Yes, um, it's hanging on my wall just there. And it, it, he, yeah. he angrily looks at me and tells me to get back to work. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like the uh, portrait I had of, of Barbara <laughs> on my desk. Get on with it. Yes. <laughs> always, exactly. sort of, always sort of, <laughs> yeah, you're not doing enough, do more. <laughs> Exactly. You haven't got a, another peerage yet from the king. Go and bother him. <laughs> oh, well, okay. Well, uh, thanks. Uh, and if you didn't get a chance to uh, note that down, I will be providing links to both 
of his social media pages on online at some point. Um, so thanks so much, Liam. It was a delight to chat with you as always. And thank you for spending time with us today. I know I learned a lot. And uh, I look forward to the pleasure of your company uh, for our next live edition of Stuart Saturday in January. So until then, to use Liam's line, keep it Stuart. Goodbye.